Dzień dobry Państwu. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are starting another panel during our meeting. And the panel is entitled Secure Digital Lending in Poland. So what rules regulate e-lending by libraries? Konrad Gliściński, PhD from Jagiellonian University, from the Chair of Intellectual Property Right, and who also collaborates with the Centrum Cyfrowe Foundation, will present, I hope, quite emotional, okay, I can already see these emotions here, well, some thesis on how to solve the problem, what this new idea behind e-lending could be. I believe that this statement will stir uh, emotions here. Now, what our, who our panelists are, let me introduce from my left, MP Daria Gosek Popiołek, Leszek Szafrański, PhD, Deputy Director for Digital Resources of Jagiellonian University Library, and Ms. Barbara Gavryluk, a journalist, a writer, and an author of numerous excellent books for children and many works or studies on children's literature. After the presentation of Mr. Konrad Gliściński, I will ask our speakers to refer to what we have heard, and then we will have time for questions from you, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that Mr. Konrad Gliściński will mainly receive questions concerning his report. Now, one of the main threads um, discussed here have been this appetite for risk and appetite for other things. And I believe that we are already looking forward to what uh, Mr. Konrad Gliściński will tell us about. As I've said, I'll speak about the report that we have prepared together with Future for Lab as part of Knowledge Rights to Anyone program. I will tell you about secured digital lending, about the possibilities of using this concept in the currently binding Polish law. So let us start from defining what this study concerned. So basically, we had two research questions. So first and foremost, whether e-lending of books by libraries in the ISDL model is allowed under international and European Union law, because this is um, the main condition for us to discuss whether it is it can be used um, in the Polish law, and also whether the laws of the individual countries surveyed allow libraries to e-lend books in the ISDL model. Now, what methodology did we use? We had a questionnaire that we sent to lawyers who specialize in copyright uh, and intellectual property rights with reference to libraries. And the conclusion here was quite difficult for us because we managed to collect 22 questionnaires. Well, we got more of them, but we managed to conduct this study in 22 countries. And 
unfortunately, uh, what we learned while conducting this study was this huge lack of knowledge on the topic. Maybe it is not surprising, but it shows us, well, how can uh, library people uh, operate if those who are to tell them what they can and what they can't do don't have the knowledge themselves. Now, apart from the questionnaires, as part of which we tried to find out what the situation looked like in individual legal orders, we also analyzed the law, literature and rulings with this regard. Now, in order to uh, start our session, we need to uh, define some terminology the terminology that we use in our report and that will allow us to tell you what this model of e-lending is about. Now, according to our analysis, e-lending itself, namely the possibility of lending, of remote um, lending of books, can be based on three principles. So we can talk about e-lending that is based on licenses. And this is the most popular model. So we have a library that gets a license and based on this license, it e-lends books. Apart from it, we have this e-lending model, which is not based on a license, so a permission or authorization of the right holder, but on a certain limitation of copyright. So here we have two main models of this kind of e-lending. So this model uh, is used in the United States. It is now used, but maybe it won't be used in the future. It is called the controlled digital lending and something that we called secured digital lending just to uh, differ it from the cdl so there's this so both controlled digital lending and secured digital lending are used on the limitation of copyright but on the other hand imposes on those who lend books uh, additional obligations so you can't just lend books anyway anyhow but you need to fulfill certain requirements there's also this friction free model maybe it's not very original uh, but this model won't be acceptable from the point of view of copyright so the situation where a library or a different entity uh, lends books without any limitations, any, um, then such lending is seen as illegal. But I'm speaking here about this friction-free model because the question whether we agree or disagree whether e-lending can be done as part of secure digital lending, we can still bear in mind that books are available on the internet and people can download them. So this is this uh, reality that we want to oppose by some legal uh, reality. Now, in the United States, there's the controlled digital lending and it is based on two elements. Well, both models make it possible to digitalize paper books for them to be e-lent. So both models are based on three basic prerequisites. So first and foremost, a library needs to have a legal copy um, of a paper book. Secondly, this e-lending as opposed to friction-free e-lending has to be based on this principle one user uh, one copy one user which is related to some 
technical uh, limitations. And if you want to uh, lend books according to this model, libraries need to use some technical measures, which will make sure that following uh, after some period of time, this book cannot be used by a user anymore. So these models are similar with this regard. However, they have different legal grounds. And they are extremely important here because this controlled digital lending model is based in the United States on the combination of their fair use doctrine and first sale doctrine. And the model that we are talking about has a totally different legal ground. It is based on the directives of the European Union, but the directives that are based on this closed catalogues of possible exceptions and limitations. I will speak about it in greater detail in a moment. So there are two different directives. So article number six uh, of directive on lending uh, right. Uh, and the second is the um, article number five of the InfoSoc directive. Now, in our secure the digital lending, we have the combination of this lending act with public lending rights, namely remuneration uh, for public lending. Now, in the United States, this provision of law does not exist, and this causes certain doubts from the point of view of international uh, law. And now, in the United States, now the greatest organization in the world that has been involved in lending books based on the controlled digital lending model was Internet Archive, but Internet Archive has been sued by a group of publishers who believe that using controlled digital lending model is against the law. Now we have the ruling of the court of first instance. It's from uh, December last year, and it's included in our report. And this uh, ruling is negative. So the court of first instance uh, has declared that this controlled digital lending model isn't fully proper. Now, we've talked to people from the Internet Archive and they are going to appeal against this ruling. But on the other hand, the, uh, our uh, independent secure digital le learning has different legal grounds. And because we have this public lending right to remuneration, from our point of view, this ruling in the United States um, isn't very important for us. Now, when it comes to secure digital lending, it's a form of making books available, uh, which is very clearly defined. So what requirements have to be met for such lending to take place? And what is of key importance to understand this model uh, are two elements. So first, it is based on uh, the presumption that a library can lend uh, e-books that it has digitalized on its own. So if it has digitalized the book, if it has, uh, if it's bought a legal copy of a book, it can then digitalize it and then uh, make this copy available digitally, so e-lend it. And we need to think, what is the legal qualification of e-lending from the perspective of international law. Now, at the level of international law, the 
lending institution is not uh, legalized, um, is not defined by the law. So there is no direct regulation on lending right. We have the rental right, but we are not interested in it because rental is of commercial character and lending of non-commercial character. So according to some people, this lending right is perhaps part of the right to enter on the market. Well, it's an interpretation which is dominant. But this also means that if this lending is treated as part of the right of entering on the market, such activity will concern only or exclusively paper copies. And this raises the question, how on the grounds of international law can we qualify e lending and now it turns out that the most probable legal qualification is treating e lending from the point of view of public communication right and it's based on the copyright treaty so at the level of the international law, we can separate this lending of material copies, and it is uh, based on the right to enter on the market. And on the other hand, we have this lending that is related to non-material copies, so digitalized copies. And here we have the... Um, right of communication to the public. And now the question is, because if um, there's the exhaustion of the right in case of paper uh, books, but not necessarily in case of e-books. Now, international agreements make it possible to introduce exceptions and limitations to this right. And they have to fulfill uh, these three step uh, test and perhaps this three stage test isn't that scary. So this is all when it comes to international law. So this understanding of e-lending and lending uh, has been understood this way in the EU. So on the one hand, we had this lending and uh, exhaustion of the right. And on the other hand, we have e-lending. We have no separate exception, but using the EU law, it was believed uh, or agreed until 2016 that e-lending was not legal. So it was not legal under EU law. So this e-lending was unacceptable. So that was the dominant interpretation. Very many lawyers, prominent lawyers from the EU appealed for this e-lending to be regulated and to be acceptable because it is bizarre that in the 21st century, libraries cannot uh, e-lend books, but well, uh, until then, it was not acceptable. Now, why was it not acceptable or permi permitted? Because it was shown that in the directive, we had this notion of a copy and that this notion of a copy concerned only paper copies uh, of books in material form. So that was the dominant interpretation until the VOB ruling, which 
reversed that interpretation showing that it was incorrect and on the grounds of the EU law, a different interpretation is now binding because it said that this notion of a copy included in the directive, when it comes to the rental right, it concerns only material copies. However, there's no legal ground for, uh, for this notion of a copy to be treated only as a paper copy under lending right. So this ruling was preceded by the opinion of Professor Maciej Spunar, general spokesperson of the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, which said that libraries played a very important role in public life and they couldn't uh, be um, deprived of the basic tool of operation. So that opinion also uh, said that this notion of a copy also included a digital copy. So this VOB ruling uh, gives us this foundation for our discussion on e-lending because it meant that e-lending was part of library lending. And if we have library lending, then it may also concern e-books. So there are no doubts concerning this. And now this VOB ruling is an important part of what I'm going to uh, say. So it is said that uh, a library can e-lend books uh, on the condition that it has uh, a paper book that comes from a legal source. And we will see in a moment how we can deal with this problem of the legal source. Now this VOB ruling is the uh, binding interpretation of the EU law. However, there's also some criticism of this um, ruling. And however, we believe that this uh, criticism uh, has no grounds. Now, unfortunately, the VOB uh, verdict hasn't solved all the problems. First and foremost, it didn't answer the question, where from should a library have access to uh, a book from a legal source? So this access from a legal source should be a publisher uh, or a license agreement. Okay. If we have a book which is available based on a license and this license excludes the right for lending, so does this VOB ruling break through this license element or not? Secondly, uh, what also turned out to be, to have even more importance practically was that libraries cannot always buy such licenses. It's not that uh, if a library wishes to pay, the, publishers, the publisher will always give a license to a book. Very often it happens that publishers don't want to give licenses to books, even though libraries wish to pay for them. So this purchasing autonomy of libraries uh, should be important here. And at the same time, it is limited. So e-lending based on licensing uh, is this dependent form of secure digital lending. But now libraries can say the following. OK, if publishers don't want to sell us licenses, or they limit our uh, possibility of further lending, maybe digitalization of a collection might be a solution. Uh, so what would be the legal ground 
for digitalization of a collection for e-lending. So we were looking for legal basis in the ruling in the case Ega Ulmer, which was mentioned today. It is the same. Um, it is the same ruling, but it has different name. So it's either Ega and Ulmer or. Uh, uh, so for the case of the endings of terminals, the library has the right to digitalize paper versions of the books. So if you are reading the very directive, so this right, it is not explicitly stated. However, we must not um, allow libraries um, to make something render a valuable on terminals, uh, making at the same time it um, and not allowing them for digitalizing it. That is why the right to digitalize collection was uh, inferred from the directive and from the uh, consent to present it in terminals. So in fact, in our opinion, um, what we um, concluded is that if we connect the ruling, the VOB, uh, which defines a copy with the logic that was um, um, included in the Egan, Egan Ulmer ruling. This will allow us for the digitalization of collections for the needs of lending that is within the independent digital learning, irrespective of the conditions of publishers. So, our interpretation is certainly in the very VOB ruling does not have any justification, but it is seen in the um, uh, opinion of the uh, Attorney General, Mr. Maciej Szpunar, who observed that on the basis of the logic that was used in that Ramstadt ruling, you can also have the same type of digitalization. So the works on while working on the study of this ruling, we got in touch with Mr. Attorney and he said yes. So, um, uh, so obviously, the issue is not closed within the EU legislation, but there is also such interpretation that is possible. And having it all in mind, we can also analyze the 22 countries that we mentioned here. And also, we have the preconditions for the law so that uh, um, so that to analyze in which we might have um, the uh, analysis of the legal system. So is there any right for the libraries to digitalize collections, that is uh, books, or very extensive right to reproduce? So in the majority of countries, the um, libraries have a reproduction right, which is very extensively interpreted. Therefore, it also includes digitalization. So we also wanted to see whether the digitalization right comprises also the right to lend, uh, to lend these books which are digitalized. So in some countries, it is inferred directly, but also, um, we can add regulations concerning lendings uh, to the Darmstadt ruling. So another thing is that whether there is a right to get remuneration for such lendings. So I'm not going to bother you with the analysis of what it looked like in specific countries. That is why 
uh, I would like to instead, I would like to present to you the general conclusions. So generally speaking, the general conclusion is that there is no legal system in the countries that we studied in which we could say that everything in 100% is done in the legal system of a given country, that everything is legal and obeys the law. We also, there is no direct, there are no direct grounds in a given country for e-learning and digitalization. Only there were two countries which suggested, precluded the regulations for uh, e-learning and digitalization without stating the, the source of this country. Mm. And another country is Ukraine, which included, introduced the regulations quite recently. So it was in January last year. Therefore, such a significant conclusion, which needs to be presented here, is that the e-lending model is really narrow, allowing for very slight activities, digitalization of selecting books and e-lending also this. So this is the model one book plus one copy, one digital copy. And let me also refer to the presentation of Professor Ganga, because everything that we analyzed and also the analysis of the rulings give us grounds to state that with regards to copyright, we first of all um, should refer to some interpretation that would include the human rights into, into our understanding. So this is the outcome of the rulings. So for example, the tribunal, the Court of Human Rights must says that we must include the fundamental rights of all users. So there is no freedom of the countries to do so, but it puts actually an obligation on the countries to behave like that. And here you have an indication that we must guarantee that copyright and its exceptions must also guarantee all the existing rights which are fundamental rights and in this report we tried to work out the methodology or the basis of the methodology methodology in what scope the fundamental rights facilitate the interpretation which allows for e-lending in national legal system and to close two words about our evaluation of the Polish context. So it's nice to talk about generalized issue, but specific cases are also interested. So we had, uh, so we analyzed uh, our national uh, legislation with regards to the three elements. So the first condition says that in the national law, we need to have the possibility of digitalization of the books by libraries. In Poland, it's not stated directly. We do not have the right to digitalize books for e-lending, but we have the right to reproduce the books to protect the collections. And one of the interpretations, perhaps it's not dominating, which you can find in the comment, which is quoted here. So it points to the fact that it's all right, but the regulation of article 28 point two gives us the right to digitalize the collections, not all of them, but a part of them, but only with an objection, with an objective to protect them and to keep them. So in my opinion, this interpretation is not convincing because if you look at the entire article 28 and see how it is constructed, you will see that irrespectively of what point number two says, you can also see that this can be used for lending the copy, the reproduced copies. So in my opinion, this is how we evaluated that. So this is the legal basis. If the library has the right to reproduce and if it has the right to lend what they reproduced, so 
there is no reason why library using the same argument and also supported by the argument to uh, to protect the fundamental rights of the users. So why shouldn't we interpret this like that? And also we understood that although there is no direct, there are no direct grounds for digitalization, but it is possible to interpret the act in such a way. The second prerequisite was much simpler for us. It is the evaluation of the possibilities of e-lending a digitalized book by libraries for e-lending. So traditionally, the copyright says that the Article 28 says it mentions uh, lending the copies of works. And traditionally, in copyright law, it was believed that lending the copies was about lending the paper copies. But the truth is that it was never stated openly that a copy is defined as the paper version of the book. It is only the interpretation, which has a very long tradition, but in fact, directly, it does not stem from the regulations. However, in the, the doctrine says, and, and I must agree with that, that the notion of lending, the notion of copies can be made more precise, namely how it is interpreted in the ruling, because in fact, the entire case, the entire issue is whether the copies are also defined as digital copies as well. So in my understanding, there is no reason why we shouldn't add the same regulation, the same provision. That is why we decided that it was possible to interpret the regulation like that. So it was not stated explicitly, but it was possible to in, to have such an interpretation. And finally, one more thing, because the uh, regulations concerning public learn, lending rights are interpreted differently and they relate to various legal acts. And we put a lot of effort into it and probably there might be some errors in the report. So in our country, it is quite simple because we have the regulation, but this situation is far from being obvious. So if you read it, the, re the regulation, seeing that uh, from the point of view of lending the copies of book um, expressed with words in a printed form, so you can also have the right to be remunerated. A library has it. So the remuneration does not come from printing. It's based on the number of the copies lent. And also it is the, mm, the same conclusion with regards to the other copy. So actually you pay on the basis of how many copies have been lent. So if you take the uh, the definition of a copy, you will see that if this is a copy, fine. If this is a digital copy, it's also fine. Therefore, we came to the conclusion that also the third prerequisite is met. That is why we believe, in our opinion, that on the basis of the regulations that we have, mm, and the interpretation that is based on some dynamic vision of the provisions and dynamic knowledge of the fundamental rights of the users. So you might believe that on the basis of that, the libraries will be allowed to uh, offer e-lending e of the books that have the paper versions. But every lawyer will obviously bring the reservations to it. But in our opinion, there are convincing arguments which uh, actually will comprise the model of independent e-learning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, doctor. And now I will just speaking from myself, let me add 
that while listening to this contribution, I realized that there is a problem which is also very important or very significant with regards to the access to information for people with disability, especially the disability of the visual organ. So only 10% of people with disabilities of vision use the Braille language, and also a very small uh, share of books is available in this version. But because such people have the access to um, widely defined literature in a digital model, it is a different dimension of availability. Therefore, we need to remember uh, about it. But this is all about my own reflections and let's move on to uh, what crossed the mind of the panelists. So I would like to give the floor over to Ms. Barba, uh, Daria Gosek popiołek Thank you very much for the work of this team, because I have a feeling that it's quite late that we start to talk about the principles of ebook lending and the access. So it's quite late, but it's not too late to correct some issues and some things. So when I was listening to the presentation of the doctor, what I realized was that we are in a situation of a revolutionary change with regards to the possibility of democratization of the access to literature. And at the same time, we have a very extensive need, very extensive needs of the users. We have the issue of copyright, and also we have the issue of the interest of the publishing houses. That's why these elements seem to be interconnected. So uh, I can say that I have a great need to specify these regulations so that they are not so apt to many interpretations. And this will happen, especially that we are at the moment of some legislative changes, especially with regards to the operation of the copyright and also with regards to the rights of authors, uh, and artists and the use of some streaming platforms. So these uh, subjects will be have to will have to be analyzed. Uh, is and I will try to um, make the research uh, group also considered in these opinions. So I'm just looking at my own notes. So there is one more significant issue that comes to my mind here. So we are living in the model in which we believe that we, uh, the material copies exist and also that books might also have paper version and uh, digital version. But the way in which young people operate within literature is so it illustrates something different. So for example, some portals like such as WordPad that ends with a publication of a book. Frequently, it is only an ebook. So sometimes it is only a publication that operates in the internet. In the internet. So um, the question is: Do libraries, as uh, places that must respond to the needs of various generations, should also get into the sphere? So uh, let me give the floor over to next speaker. So perhaps we'll return to that issue. Yes, I will agree with the MP that we were too late when starting the discussion. Because for many years, we have had various digital publishers or electronic publishers. So whatever they might be called, many of us have already may become acquainted with them. And, we, and still, it's quite difficult to adapt the copyright to it. We do not have any 
uh, right like this. So we should also differentiate various publications and um, these publications are scientific or not. So these are two diverse things. All the publications to which we might have the access from the point of view of a library, uh, they might have, there might be a large problem in rendering them available. And it all depends on the context of what we lend. So whether these are the collections which are already in the public domain. So here in accordance with the principles of copyright law, uh, the uh, property rights have already been exhausted. They have simply expired. So it is not lending, but only the uh, distribution. And also the most recent publications uh, in which everybody involved would like to have the access, which are regulated by copyright. And for this access cannot be get, obtained in a simple way. And also it's quite difficult to lend them. So libraries started to cope with that in a uh, in a number of ways. Some of them agree for the prospective infringement of law, whereas some of them try to render these collections available. And also we are dealing with a significant issue of scientific publications, which in a, according to the new principles of academic communication, um, especially in Europe or worldwide. So so it is says the open science, open access to scientific publications, which were published using public resources, public money. So somebody has already paid for the publication and the author, should they agree, renders the book available via their own uh, resources or via libraries to repositories or systems of digitalizing and such systems digitalizing systems are available everywhere and anyone can have access to them but we also have obligatory copies so should uh, such obligatory copies be rendered available in any other form? So um, this is the question of what men was mentioned by the report. So what are the principles for lending such publications? And um, do we, we have some possibilities. So can we purchase the license? But if the publisher disagrees, the publishers start to um, uh, to use various platforms which lend the books, which are the property of the publisher and not the library. So the library purchases the license and not the book and uh, renders it available to its user. So these are the books and this is all legal because the publisher sees to the issue of a license and the, it is one thing. And another thing is that a library already has some items, some books which they purchased or which they received as a part of the obligatory copy. So certainly they purchased the book. So in accordance with what we wrote, we can see that probably uh, the library is the owner. So. Theoretically, the library could lend it, but here comes another problem. In accordance with all the principles, uh, the, so they, it might, might lend the books on the territory of its building that is within the library. And theoretically, if these are scientific books, the Article 28 men mentions also a point that these books can be lent uh, at the end of terminals, actually for the research and cognition needs within various academic processes. So it is quite possible, but learning Con uh, lending consists in the fact that somebody needs to physically arrive at the library. And if they are physically there, they would rather prefer 
to lend a, a, to borrow a paper version and not to sit at the end of the terminal reading the entire book because this might be somehow tiresome because at that point it might turn out that a book available somewhere in the net be uh, available so here we have a problem which says that lending is not necessarily the lending as such but lending in inverted commas so this is just the presentation of what the library has in its collections and the third thing that is the possibility of lending so the, this is the area where the most difficulties is and uh, uh, in order to make it legal we need to ask the author of the publisher for presenting us the license so in the case of an open license the author agrees for everything so we can borrow the book to anyone and only say where it was but when the publisher wants us to regulate the access to such an item we really would have to apply some uh, software mechanism so that uh, lending could be possible in any possible way so libraries had different approaches to that so sometimes for example the um, the readers the such as kindles were le were lent so for example such a an option was uh, ciphered or uh, uh, encrypted or not so uh, certainly the this was quite costly if the library was supposed to uh, make so many additional sources so who would have to buy the reading devices so that the readers could buy the files uh, could borrow the files in which they are interested so there is a number of problems connected with the lending that is why there are no direct uh, principles which would say yes you can do that no you cannot so again uh, uh, there is an option that the open access should be made available in academic libraries and as soon as we get the copyright from the author we can do it in a legal way so the problem is immediately solved but again it is not a lending like the one that we are talking about but also the uh, distribution uh, and uh, uh, which was the subject to the library's consent but in the case of such lending but definitely lending so that you could physically carry the book from the library or download it so we have the uh, IT barrier, which is quite costly, but it obviously uh, can can be passed, but it's never legally regulated. So the question is, at what point do we break the law? So it is a difficult question for a start. So uh, let's perhaps um, have a round of contributions and then questions. <laughs> We keep talking about some protections or what should be done so that we could read an e-book at home. I must say that I prepared myself before this conference and I looked through 60 libraries that are in this system where remuneration of uh, public lending is uh, issued and none of the libraries in Małopolska region are on this list of libraries. So it means that we are harmed by this from the very start. Now, big libraries, they have this possibility to e-lend books. And I know that in this room we have people who are experts 
in library issues. And so this e-lending uh, is done through different platforms. So for example, MPIC Go. So readers get codes and they lend books or borrow books through codes. But I've never seen a library that would digitalize its copy and make it available to readers. Well, I'm not sure if it happens anywhere, definitely not among these 60 libraries that I have uh, checked. Uh, the majority of these 60 libraries don't lend, don't e-lend. Uh, books. For authors, this means a black hole uh, when it comes to public lending right. We have no clue which of the books have been lent, uh, which, which books have been lent as paper copies and which of them as e-books. And when I ask for ask for information whether ebooks were calculated to, I received this information that you have shown us, namely on uh, printed copies, because a printed copy is not an ebook but a paper book. So that was quite surprising for me when you said that this uh, term hmm, paper copy could be also interpreted as ebook. Okay, yes. So that was my first question. I don't have this presentation on me. Yes, I have the sentence here. Yes. Well, as you read this regulation, it says that Public, public lending right remuneration results from copies of works that have been published in Polish in a printed version. So if we are to speak about this remuneration, it means that such lending that concerns books that were initially published in Polish and in print can uh, be grounds for this remuneration. So if a book that was originally an ebook, we're talking about uh, publishing houses of ebooks um, too, they are not covered by this regulation. But Article 28 doesn't tell us that this remuneration is for copies of printed works. Now, if we understand this copy of a printed work, also uh, understand it also as a digital uh, copy, then when it comes to books that were initially uh, in print and then digitalized, well, they are covered by Article 28. However, this article doesn't cover books that were digitally born. So yes, I'm talking about this one class of cases. Now, an author, when he uh, signs an agreement with a publisher, he usually signs it for all possible forms of publication. So in print, ebook, audiobook, and also adaptations. But all of us are aware that we also sign this agreement for um, e-lending. But then, if there are no legal regulations for such books to be e-lent by libraries, well, what can be done? And I do trust in honesty of librarians, but there's this precedence from a couple of months ago where a book that was supposed to become part of a library catalog by accident by some omission was just uh, openly available online 
50 copies of the books were downloaded. It's one of the most famous and popular uh, children uh, writers. So yes, there's this litigation uh, awaiting the librarian that did that. So there were no protections. It was impossible to stop this process until this copy was removed. So these regulations are absolutely, these protections are vital for us authors. And what are they, watermarks? Well, this model that we're talking about, well, okay, I agree with you that now this e-lending doesn't exist. And this was one of the reasons why we did this report, actually to show that such e-lending is actually legal and can be done. One of the elements of the system is imposing on a library this necessity to cover individual digital uh, copies with the DRM system. Because this prevents such activities. Currently, libraries don't implement this system because they don't have such a possibility. We show them this interpretation, which, according to us, makes this possible. Now, as we carried out also other studies and research on cultural institutions, well, we know that Okay, so the probability that libraries will base their activities on the interpretation of the law, which is only an interpretation, is very low. If we truly want ebooks to be available and for libraries to be able to lend ebooks, we need to change the law. First and foremost, when it comes to the EU law, well, it is already legal. Um, under our act, it is partly legal, but we know that if we went with this interpretation to libraries, uh, and if we were to talk to their legal departments, they would say, okay, it's a very nice interpretation. However, we don't recommend uh, that it is implemented. So yes, this risk appetite is the way it is. And we are aware of the fact that if no clear regulation is introduced, this won't happen. Now, interpretation for GLAM has to be very clear. Now, we lawyers, we like general clauses. We uh, like it when we have this room for interpretation because we believe that uh, this is better and this is uh, what we have been taught. But the situation is that librarians and uh, other members uh, of cultural institutions just don't use these solutions. Now, when it comes to the collective management organizations, well, we have sent invitations to them to uh, become, to take part in this panel. Uh, for different reasons, uh, they are not here. And yes, we are also aware of the fact that our approach might cause the situation that remuneration on ebooks is paid and that more ebooks will be uh, lent because this will be more convenient for libraries and then you will have this remuneration under public lending rights. Uh, but because no representatives of uh, collective management organizations uh, are here, we can't have such a discussion with them. Okay, what's happening online? After all, we've been watched by several dozen of 
people or hundreds of people, uh, some questions have been asked online and there are also questions in this room. I'd like to thank you very much for this quite optimistic report that you have presented to us because it gives us hope, hope for some broader access of libraries um, or their greater potential to uh, eland books. Now the condition for a book to be e-lent is the fact that it has to be connected with public lending right. And because of this, all the academic and scientific uh, libraries are out of the list because they are not covered by public lending right in Poland. If I remember well, this American variant, Controlled Digital Lending, it covers uh, scientific and academic libraries because ebooks, okay, literature, uh, they are very often prepared in a digital form by publishers. Very often, if you have these very popular books, you have them in different formats, so audiobooks, ebooks, and so on. When it comes to scientific papers, usually it's either a paper form or uh, a digital uh, form. Very rarely uh, are there two copies simultaneously. So is there any hope for academic libraries? Well, I haven't mentioned it during my presentation. However, this issue is analyzed by our report. Now, the whole logic of public lending right in the EU is based on the ground that because you uh, lend works publicly, you are entitled to remuneration. However, certain libraries can be excluded from this principle. Now, these issues are uh, included in the report. And there are two interpretations here. So first and foremost, since member states can exclude certain categories of libraries from the public lending rights system, without at the same time excluding them from lending, because that wouldn't uh, make sense, of course, then this concerns university libraries and school libraries. So this category is excluded, but this also means that they can e-lend books. And this is this special category of libraries. So this is the interpretation that we uh, present. But there's another interpretation which goes even further or that allows for a more convenient lending of books. Now, generally speaking, if we look at the directive on lending and rental, it says, it speaks about this establishment open to the public. And literature tells us that this notion or generally lending, lending right and public lending right, they cover only public libraries, which means that university libraries or school li libraries, they don't actually lend books under copyright. So they can do what they do. However, it's out of the scope of monopoly. So it is legal because it's not covered by monopoly under law. So if they do this, they can so these are these university libraries and, and school libraries and I'm mentioning them here because this concerns the 
exceptions according to which such establishments can use works. So the possibility of lending is greater. It doesn't have to be limited in time. After all, lending is this right that's limited in time. However, if it is done for educational purposes, it is not limited by time. So these libraries are not covered by this lending right. Because they address this limited group of users. And this interpretation has been adopted by a scientific paper uh, that we actually quote in our report from Great Britain, uh, which says that university and school libraries are not the libraries that are covered by lending right well i believe that such libraries uh, at least in poland are covered by this right but since the legislator can introduce this uh, exception that they don't pay for lending, then definitely it can also be decided that they don't pay for e-lending. I hope that I answered your question. Time is flying, ladies and gentlemen. Is there anything interesting online? Yes, it's a question to Konrad, and I hope that with his answer, he will sum up some doubts. So as a library, we buy um, e-books from foreign publishers, for example, from Germany or and Great Britain, and we make them available via our terminals. Is it possible that we lend these publications to our users? I'm sorry, but I have a problem with this question. So is it possible for these e-books to be lent to users uh, so that they read them uh, whenever and uh, wherever they want? Well, we need to check what is included in the license agreement. Now, speaking from our experience, because next to our study on um, digital and, um, sorry, on controlled and uh, secure digital lending, there's also another study that's done by this CREATE uh, team from Glasgow. But generally speaking, the majority of the licenses include provisions uh, which stipulate the conditions under which lending can be done. So it's usually this agreement which decides whether lending uh, has to be limited to terminals or not. And that's why we call this model this dependent lending model. So the answer is there in the license. Let me intervene in saying that most frequently it is regulated by licenses. If such a license does not permit for lending, so it the truth is that every student and staff member of a university or an academia can use the publications which have been purchased, but it is also uh, the result of the fact that we 
by the access to platforms that land that land so in poland we also have the platforms like legimi or ibu and uh, of the polish uh, scientific publications which render the platforms available which is not obviously the purchase of a library so it is the publisher that regulates that on the basis basis of the license. So reversing the question, if the library purchased such a book, we are getting into the sphere regulated by report. So how to lend what the library has on its server or in its computer. So this is the thing which is quite difficult to be lent. So uh, this is quite simple because we we uh, do have this in the license, so we learn how to purchase it from you so that I could render it available to my users. But if it's purchased as property, as ownership, the, the problem is different. So both digitalization and lending, and also the problem that we already have the digital version. So we will render it available in scientific libraries, which is a bit simpler because we might render them available on the computers in the library. So it is not an interesting solution for the reader because not everybody wants to read a book for a couple of days uh, and go to the library. They would rather um, um, drive and listen. So uh, this kind of lending is quite problematic and you can also agree with the publisher to extend the license and then this is a problem where the publisher not necessarily wants to because they do not earn from it. So if they make it available on the platform, so they learn, they earn. But uh, if he, they are supposed to agree for our lending, uh, they stop earning because they sold it once. They sold, uh, sold the license once. So this is with regards to digital uh, items which are in libraries. There is one more. Do we have the time for one more question? And also from the floor. So we have something like four minutes. So just a short comment because I don't know if I understood well. If you have an ebook purchased from a publisher, so sh we shouldn't learn it, lend it, but uh, if we have the Polish uh, Act with Article 28, so if the rendering available should be made on the basis of the Parliamentary Act. So lending does not permit the exception. So we can have it and then use it. And it's unlimited. It is fair use. Yes, yes. It seems to me that it is the right interpretation. But just to clarify, let's not get to the analysis of the relations concerning uh, lending books on the basis of license agreements. This is the issue that another team is dealing with. But with regards to the principle, yes. So with one exception for the endings of terminals. So uh, if we have a contract, this can be used. So yes, I just listened to what you said. So I do agree that regulations concerning fair use cannot be used with the exception for one point. So such an interpretation was adopted by the ministry for when the, uh, the directive was implemented into Polish legislation. So this is how it is interpreted, but it is not the uh, 
explicit um, uh, uh, conclusion from the regulations. So this guarantees the legal safety. So there are such regulations, there are such systems which say that it can be uh, included. Uh, so I agree with the dominating interpretation, but it is not very well, it does not have very concrete, concrete legal grounds. Yes, we are looking at the watch at the clock, but it is time for coffee break. But I hope that your great appetite for knowledge have been satisfied. If not completely, I can say that the coffee break will be a good occasion to continue our discussion. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you very much, panelists. Thank you. And please enjoy the coffee break. Unfortunately, we would have to shorten the coffee break to 15 minutes, 20 maximum. I'm sorry for that.
Oops, zapraszam w takim razie. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let's reconvene this panel. We are in this panel. We are returning to European story. Should you have any need to you? use interpreting into Polish, please take the headsets. English, uh, we have two more sessions, but they are shorter, so don't worry. We know that everyone is tired. We really appreciate your presence. Uh, and um, with the lovely weather outside, uh, this brilliant space, but yeah, there is sun and, and uh, we are keeping you here. So we really appreciate that. But we have still some very exciting topics to discuss with you. We, we talked a lot uh, today during, um, during the previous sessions and the, the keynote by uh, Katarina about copyright being rather a tool, not a means in itself, serving something bigger. And uh, it's, yes, being a response, hopefully, more and more to the, the needs of the sectors that it, um, it's... Um, sets rules for. So we are, we are talking a lot about the public mission uh, of the, the heritage sector of libraries, of archives, but I think the, the, the story is the same also for, for museums. And uh, what we wanted to do in this session, in this panel, to show you and to discuss together with you also different uh, approaches to turn practitioners also into advocates for a cause and to show you some examples of research, but also advocacy networks, uh, policy discussions that are uh, currently taking uh, place in Europe, uh, hopefully inspiring you to join them. And we will kind of finish this journey through Europe, um, um, making a final stop in Denmark uh, and asking Mikkel here to my left, okay, so uh, what is, what is the Danish way uh, of being in dialogue and uh, kind of rolling a discussion between different stakeholders when it comes to uh, solutions for uh, libraries. So this is the narrative for, uh, for today. I am joined by my distinguished colleagues. And okay, let me just be brief with your views. We're gonna start with Julia Dore. Uh, Julia is a, uh, and correct me if I'm uh, wrong, because you keep changing positions, but a postdoc research fellow at the University of Trento, uh, recently moved to a faculty of law, uh, economics and, and management. And to me, that's a very good signal and a strong message saying that, okay, the discussion about copyright is also spreading, it's going outside from the law departments, but is also being seen as relevant in different ways. So that's a good move. And uh, uh, Julia is also or was part of the Re uh, Recreating Europe team, uh, focusing in her work uh, on, on the GLAM sector. So uh, without further ado, Julia, the floor is yours. I promise I stand up, so I'm standing up. And I can use this, thank you. Um, I'm using a different style of slides today because uh, Conrad always teased me for using very boring and without picture presentation. So today I'm using pictures and I hope that this will help us to finish this wonderful uh, lengthy and interesting uh, meeting. And I'm gonna talk to you about uh, secondary publication right in uh, Europe from the author's perspective. Don't get me wrong, I'm talking about the author's perspective, but this does not mean that it's that different from the library's perspective. And I will explain you why. Now, some premises about uh, the research context and the timeline. Um, with Roberto Caso, who is uh, not here, we started research on secondary publication right back in 2013. 
when we there was a discussion about uh, open access and Italian legislation trying to uh, accomplish open access uh, mandate and principles, but uh, mostly Germany was introducing uh, the law on uh, secondary publication rights. So really the discussion started there. And it continued over the years, but certainly it reached uh, at a key point in 2019 when ISA, which is the Italian Association for the Promotion of Open Science, was supporting a proposal, the Gallo proposal for a secondary publication rights that in the end never became law and it's still uh, pending before the Senate in Italy. But we have uh, promising uh, <laughs> uh, promises that uh, this uh, proposal will be back on the table of our parliament. And so uh, this is something we should still uh, work on. In the meantime, we have been dealing with the subject also uh, during the Recreating Europe uh, project, which was coordinated by Caterina Sganga. And we work very closely with the Liber, who was a partner on this. And also we approach Knowledge Rights 21, who is very, very um, active in this, uh, in this topic. And in 2023, we were heard by the European Commission, by the DG on, on Research, who is, among other things, exploring the opportunity of having a European-wide secondary publication rights. Uh, there is uh, one right, but many perspective, different interests, as usually it is with copyright. So copyright allows us to think about all the different interests of different stakeholders, often in conflict, but not necessarily. I, really, I personally think that copyright does not mean always conflict, always a problem. Copyright can be understood in the proper way, it can be rephrased and reshaped in the virtuous way. Uh, if only we understand that there are some principles and values that must be protected. And one of these is the mission of the library, of the public library. All the stakeholders have expectation, as I said, and not necessarily antagonist. And the secondary publication rights seems to be really a good chance, a good opportunity to find some mediation, to, some, to find some balance in this uh, uh, usual uh, conflict, because it will allow to disseminate works to the widest audience so that more people get to know what the author is writing, what scientific authors are writing. And also the author, the scientific author, can regain some independence, some autonomy that in this current picture of a copyright seems to be lost. So authors, scientific authors, seem not to have any more power on what they are writing. And this is a problem because really contradict what was in the first place copyright. And in fact, uh, putting the emphasis on the author helps really to understand that we have to go back to the origin of copyright to understand what was the purpose of copyright and why it became so distorted, where we uh, we witness more competition rather than cooperation. We don't see the author any longer thinking about what is important. And what is important is to convey a message to the public, to dialogue with the public. And this usually happens through the publisher, but not necessarily, but mostly through the library. So the role of the library is cannot be really discussed here because it's the perfect uh, mean, the perfect instrument to uh, make sure that this message arrives to the public. And as I said, uh, saying that uh, we focus on the author perspective does not mean that the library is not considered. Indeed, it is considered. And there are different ways of uh, reaching this point of uh, enlarging the message, making sure that more people know about uh, the research. The secondary publication right is just a pillar. That this is important to, to be clarified. So it's one of the ways towards open science. There is a clear international framework, and Katerina Sganga really perfectly explained that. So this is the way forward to really understand that we have some basis to work on. It's not just uh, the way that uh, we were probably taught copyright, uh, and which is often understood as being just a way to restrict knowledge, a way to protect uh, some rights and not other, a way to bring innovation, but um, we don't really understand what innovation means in this current uh, picture. And there are different ways of uh, going to this direction. And one is, I believe, is, uh, the secondary publication right. 
it is also important to talk about this, right? Because if we look at uh, the strategies, uh, the direction that uh, the European Commission and Europe, European Union in general is building, this direction seems to go exactly to that direction. So we are going to embrace open, open sciences in a way or in another. We cannot really think that this is not happening. The problem is to understand how we can easily go there and how we can do it in the most sustainable way possible. Because of course there are different routes as it is with open access in general. We know about the different routes, know about the different shades and even color of open access. We cannot think about the fact that it's increasing the number of definitions. It's working now, <laughs> sorry. But the green open access seems to be the most sustainable way. Why I say that? Because the gold, of course, is a good route, but the gold needs often money. And we talked about the problem of lacking resources, and this is really a reality in most of our uh, environments and in most of libraries also. Our library at the University of Trento spends more than two million per year in uh, APC. And this is something that we cannot really disregard. This is really a problem. So the green open access route is the way forward. It's not the only way, but this has to be really pushed uh, forward. There are also different strategies to green routes. Uh, we discussed with uh, some of you about the retention right, the potential of other strategies, but uh, Today, I will focus on the legislative route rather than contractual, because uh, I make this important premises that, uh, and this has been already said, the author, especially the scientific author, has very little bargaining power. So they usually, we usually, unless you are a lawyer or you really have a good uh, legal uh, training, do not negotiate with the publish. You probably, and we probably in many cases just signed the agreement without even reading it. So how can we really think that we are going to negotiate with a publisher? I think this is a reality. So the legislative route really helps overcome this issue of uh, uh, witnessing uh, uh, the lack of bargaining power. And it's a response to this uh, imbalance. Why is that? Because we ask the law to intervene and to make sure that authors, especially we will begin with scientific authors, but this does not mean that cannot be applied to other uh, environments, of course, but we begin with scientific author, have this right, which has to be inalienable and unavailable. And this is very important. That cannot be overridden by contract, otherwise it will make no sense to open scientific publication. There was a discussion yesterday and also in other venues about this name, secondary publication right, may be unfortunate that was named secondary because it means that is like does not have the same value as the primary. But let's for a second think that this is really the compromise to reach our goal, that is to open scientific publications. So a right that can be probably defined better as a right to open science. And this right will enable basically to surf archive. And so to publish and communicate to the public, the scientific publication, at least, and here I'm just mentioning examples, uh, finance by public found with no percentage. So here I'm presenting really the ideal situation where we don't put too much uh, boundaries, too many restrictions. Otherwise, it becomes very fragmented as it really is with some countries having uh, legislated on the secondary publication right. And also the fact that uh, has to be put and stored in an institutional repository should mean something. Should mean something because it is there that we don't really see the peril, the danger of a commercial use, that it's really frustrating the nights of everyone in this, in this discourse. And using the open licensing seems also to be natural, immediate, because we also talk about this, because, that usually, and this is also another reality, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, 
we think we are licensing with the broader term, but if we don't use an open license, we are not doing it. And this is often underestimated. And I think it should be um, emphasized the fact that the proper terms of the license have to be stated and have to be um, made explicit. And of course, cannot be overridden by contract, as I said, or technology because in that case, it's not enforceable and it's not all right anymore. And the publisher can be mentioned, should be mentioned in most of the provisions that have been enacted. This is specified and this is important, of course, but this does not mean that the author cannot do anything else with the publication. And in fact, why is I am saying this and I'm going to the conclusion, don't worry, because there are important philosophical roots behind it. As I said in the very beginning, it's the message that we are conveying to the public that is important. It's the freedom, our um, autonomy as uh, author, as researchers that has to be protected because it's part of the right of uh, and the freedom of expression and information. It has a complex net copyright nature. I will not linger on this because it becomes too complex and also uh, problematic to discuss whether it should be considered an economic right and a moral right or both of them. So I will leave it to, to perhaps the discussion. But it's important to say that it belongs to the author, not to the institution. And it should not be conceived as an obligation because that if we do that, we don't see anymore the fact that is a way to uh, communicate with the public. And it's a way to address different things. Then I can stop actually here saying that the European Union is discussing this, this opportunity and there are important reasons why this is happening. First, because there are national laws, some of them, not many countries have, but there are now a few that legislate on uh, secondary publication right. But there are already too many differences and peculiarities that make this landscape fragmented. So one has a percentage, one specified the version of the manuscript, the other says uh, cannot be commercial, the other say yes. So you can see that this is already prob a problem for the internal market. So the reason for and the necessity for harmonization is already there is blatant. But there are also, uh, on top of that, national laws that are legislating and that have legislated on open access, like in Italy, but do not provide really the right landscape for secondary publication right. And there is the commitment of important support and advocacy actions, as you, you say it by Liber, by Knowledge Rights 21, and many others that express, and even Ali, a lot of um, statements were uh, very recently published in support of this right. There is the interest of the EC, and there is, again, the urgency to safeguard this right. But this is something that I already said. What is important now to do? First, we have to understand the complexity of the issues. And I said, when I mentioned can be moral, can be economic, this is already a nightmare for a copyright lawyer. So imagine for a policymaker what this can be. But it is also difficult to imagine a norm that find everybody on the same page. As usual, the compromise is gonna be very tough, especially the point of embargo, which I believe should not be there, but I trust that it's gonna be very, very difficult to make policy makers understand that embargo is not needed. And there are, of course, different intersections. I mentioned the um, retention right, but I can talk about uh, revocation. I can talk about exception the limitation and also on um, licensing in general. But at this point, what can library do? And I will conclude. For libraries have, to, first of all, to inform because there is a lack of information and on copyright in general, and this is something that we realize because we lawyers are not informed. So think about those that are non-lawyer, how much they need to be informed. You have to share, you have to support, you have to inspire. And this is something that you are already doing. And I see this, I can tell that from the presence of, of today. So treasure your public mission, do it what you have to do, do the right thing because it's right and that's all. Uh, thank you, Julia. Thank you for being Uh, message. I think what I'm getting from it is just that libraries 
um, they also have a, a very strong say or should have a stronger say in you know, the discussion uh, around copyright copyright that is then touches up, uh, that touches upon their work and uh, I think we're gonna turn to Stephen to understand a bit more how this can be done in a uh, I can also I think this one is working uh, and the clicker so in a in a European or even broader context. So just, uh, you've met Stephen before and he's exquisite Polish, uh, but just as a re reminder, uh, Stephen is a director of policy and advocacy at IFLA, leading IFLA's policy work with a particular focus on copyright, access to information, freedom of expression and digital issues. And he's also a member of the management committee of Knowledge Rights 21. And I think we're gonna turn into the story about uh, Knowledge 21. That's not you? Okay, więc na pewnie będę próbował mówić po polsku ten raz, więc to już coś. I won't try and speak Polish. There was an exhibition about Copernicus at, at the library at the moment, but I didn't, having lived in Poland, I know that any reference to Copernicus is a good thing. So um, I apologize for using Copernicus here, but I, I think, I don't know, this will make sense shortly. Um, what I'm going to do, so I'm, Maya's introduced me better than I can and in probably in a more flattering way than I would have done. Um, but what I want to do here is set out some of the ideas behind Knowledge Rights 21, what, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve, and yeah, and what we're trying to achieve and set out, I think, reinforce some of those points about the importance of, of getting involved and the legitimacy, the, the agency of libraries in trying to push for change. Um, a lot of this will come from a European perspective. So if I'm saying something rude, it's not about Poland, it's about Brussels. Just, just, just to say that right now. Um, so, I think the, the the fundamental issue that I want to cover is the risk, the feeling that's already been talked about a, a couple of times already today. That um, we're starting from the wrong place when we're making policy about research, about education, about access to culture. Um, and this is the obvious Copernicus reference that we're in a situation where research is orbiting around copyright and not copyright around research. This is the Copernican revolution that, that we need to, to make happen. Um, and so what I'm we'll trying to get into is, well, what are the elements, what are the contours, what's the shape of an approach that actually achieves that, that switches things, that, that, that performs that Copernican revolution? Um, to give an idea of some of the signposts of, of how we're looking at things all wrong, that the Aristotelian, that the medieval um, approach isn't working. Um, at the European level, it, it, it's kind of crazy, actually, that within the European Commission, the bits of the Commission that deal with research and education and culture don't actually have any legislative power. They're not allowed to pass laws. Laws are made elsewhere. They're made by other parts of the commission whose job is not necessarily to focus on research, on education, on access to culture. And therefore it means that when you're passing these laws, there's not sufficient attention to, the, to these factors, these issues which, which Katerina has already set out are based in fundamental rights. And, and so really shouldn't be something that you think about further down the road. And, and so, we're in the situation where instead of our focus being there, we almost have to see research, education, access to culture as, as islands. And this is a, a term that we even heard from a, a member of former European Commissioner Maria Gabrielle's cabinet, that the logic is they're seeing these really key fundamental issues as exceptions, as islands in the stream, rather than an overall goal, rather than something that really needs to be prioritized. So to go into a little bit more depth, so one example, whenever the European Union carries out legislation, it's supposed to do an impact assessment. It's supposed to look at the ideas, look at the options and assess, well, what would these mean in different key areas? However, the guidance for thinking about research, education, access to culture, it's not very clear. 
And in particular, the focus on research is very much focused on SMEs, on innovative companies. It's not focused on the sort of work that's carried out here at the Jagiellonian University. It's not focused on the interests of libraries. We're lucky if it's given that priority. And so legislation is being made without consideration, without thought about what the side effects, what the negative impact might be. So in the Copyright Directive, Articles 15 and 17 that focused on press publishers' rights and on platform regulation, on filtering, there's nothing in the impact assessment, no consideration of the impact on platforms, on repositories and so on. He's only got in by luck. It's not got much better since then. So there's a failure. And part of the risk of this is that, and this is, sorry, this is the Monty Python reference. We're letting non-research people make the laws about research, which really doesn't feel like this, the, the, it doesn't feel like the most sensible way forwards. So yeah, so you can see that, that I don't know, the focus is not in the right place. We're asking the non-experts to make the laws. What we, we do know, of course, is that there is a, a cast of characters. There are established arguments, established ideologies, established battle lines that exist around copyright that will see big content producers fight it out against big digital players and so on. And the arguments are everyone, they're, they're, they're ready to stand up. They're ready to shout, to make a lot of noise. They're very organized. They can mobilize lots of people. They can send in the rock stars. And they can send in the, the, the fantastic authors to come and talk. But the problem is then it means that the voice of libraries, which I was talking about badly in, in Polish at the beginning, too often isn't heard because the debate has been taken over. The debate has been, been captured, arguably. And we get to the stage where, for example, I don't know, I said things are seen in almost a, a theological way that the idea of weakening copyright in any way, it's the thin end of the wedge, that it's the beginning of the end of the world, that a single act, a single mistake by a librarian, for example, in placing work online by accident. I, I, I know the law, the, the codes of ethics for librarians are pretty clear that that's not what you're supposed to do. Accidents happen. But when that happens and that you should cut them down and try and prosecute them and take them to court, that, that's overreaction. That, that's too much. People make mistakes. People make mistakes in other situations. And so we need to move away from this sort of simple like beating each other over the head. Um, so what we need to do rather is to perform that Copernican revolution, to look at the telescope from the correct end, not from the wrong end, and start to think, well, what does that look like? What do we need to get there? Um, and crucially, to do that, we need to think, well, who are the stakeholders that need to be involved? And the argument I would, I would say is, is libraries. I think it's Julia made the point very well that you know, libraries have this really key role in enabling preservation of, access to, reuse of, recreation of knowledge, focus on the interests of the researchers, of students, of users, the future. We need to boost that voice. We need to strengthen that voice, make sure that it's properly heard. And we need to think, well, we mobilize. How can we help? How can we provide this, make sure there's this critical mass, this momentum for research and education and access to culture-centered policy? Also, how do we sustain this into the future? And this is where the Knowledge Rights 21 program looks to come in to make sure that we are making this voice heard today into the future that we need to address the fact that, as we've seen from COVID-19, laws aren't well set up for enabling access. And we're grateful to the support of the Arcadia Fund to be able to do so. In terms of areas where we're focusing, we'll dig a little bit more into some of these, especially on the evidence base. I think the key thing, and this is exactly what Centrum Cifrove is doing here in Poland, is to build those networks, to underline that everyone, that you do have agency, you have a right to be spoken, to, to speak up. You almost have a duty to speak up, to make sure that policies are not being made, neglecting without considering the interests of researchers, of librarians. So there's a big focus on that. We get involved in Brussels. So we go to the same meetings as Julia <laughs> does and, and try to change that mindset to move us towards a way of making policy based on access. And this is something that we've seen in the European research area policy agenda, 
there is that recognition that we need to think again. Um, we have a number of areas, and these are the, the contours, the, the shape of what a research-centered copyright policy, a knowledge-centered policy could look like. And we'll dig a little bit more into those. Um, for example, we would hope, we would expect that if we're doing things better, there'll be fairer access to ebooks, that there will be better protection of users' rights from override by copyright. There'll be more effective ways of getting around digital locks. There'll be a way of thinking again about purpose-based copyright laws. And again, we've talked about this before. Rather than trying to say this is exactly what you can do, we say that, well, as long as the use is fair and it supports research, that should be the right way forwards. And that allows us to avoid situations where five years after a new technology becomes mainstreamed, we're still trying to work out how to accommodate it in law. We want to accelerate progress around rights retention and around secondary publishing rights, as Julia has mentioned, and overall that different way of making policy, that research first way of making policy. Um, You've heard a lot about the first one, the legal possibilities of secure digital lending. I refer you back to Conrad on that point. Um, we're also trying to look at e-lending from a competition, from an economics perspective, because again, strange enough, copyright is not a solution for everything. Copyright is quite a specific tool. It is really not a very effective tool in approaching a lot of things. And the whole point of a research center perspective is we don't limit ourselves to one tool. We look across the board, we think, well, what is going to achieve this goal? How are we going to cut across directorate generals, cut across policy areas, cut across legislative and non-legislative tools to get there? We're doing work, and this will complement what Julia's doing, looking at the experience of implementing first-generation secondary publishing rights, because certainly we would hope that in a second generation, we can move towards a zero embargo approach. Tomorrow, we should see conclusions coming from the European Council of Ministers, it's saying very clearly we need immediate open access. We're doing work on rights retention, looking at well, what's holding people back, what needs to change, what factors favor uptake. We're looking at open norms, again, this idea of purpose-based policy around contract override, the extent to which contracts are a threat to the ability of libraries to carry out their missions, the technological protection measures, the research exceptions in general, and on how do we make sure that the interest of authors in having their work read is actually heard, that authors are not used as puppets, as marionettes by publishers, but actually their interest in being read is heard. In all of these areas, the idea is that we produce research that fills the gap in the evidence, that overcomes the fact that, again, I said a couple of times, the debate around copyright is so often based on ideologies, on assumptions, on very specific views of the world, that we aren't looking enough at what, what's actually happening, what really are the impacts. Again, that's not an original point. It's been mentioned a few times already. Oh, oh that's interesting. I didn't know that you did that. It's a new button for me. I'm sorry about that. There we go. So that, no, on the right slide now. Um, and so as I said, that key focus, we want to mobilize networks. Um, and Tintum Sifori is, your contact here. There's a real feeling I've had of, of, of momentum coming from this meeting of, I don't know, the, the vibrancy, the, 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 the debate, the, the debate that's been taking place, the questions that people have been asking, I think does indicate so well that there's an interest. I don't know, we get that there's a problem and that if we see a problem, if we're not able to fulfill our missions, maybe it's not us that are the issue, maybe it's the law and maybe the law should change. Um, we are working currently on developing a training course that tries to bring together copyright, but not just sort of copyright as you implement it, how many copies can I take and what percentage of a book can I copy, but rather trying to teach copyright and explain copyright from the perspective of how you then get involved in a discussion. How do you talk about the concepts rather than the detail and matching that with training about advocacy? something that doesn't happen, I would argue, enough in Europe. It does happen in the States and elsewhere a bit more. Supporting work in Europe, especially focusing on the next parliament from June 24. How can we make sure that there's really a mandate to go back to look again at how we do copyright better? And I said, of course, Centrum Cifrave are the contact here. But I think just to go back to that really key fundamental point that what we need to do is create sustainable networks. We need to mobilize. We need to make sure that our experience, that your experience, 
is valued, is brought to the fore. And so, yeah, it's up to you. We want a copyright that was brought, copyright to orbit around research, education, access to culture, not the other way around. You're the ones who can create this new center of gravity, who can shift the center of gravity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. I think by now you should figure out what we are trying to do here in this panel. Just try to uh, really make you feel comfortable in also like becoming active advocate for the cause that you are really in the middle uh, in the middle of, because you know the the topic best. Um, being, being practitioners, being libra librarians, archivists, um, curators at museums, you know what your daily struggles are. And of course, the networks, and we are uh, immediately going to jump to another one, can, and associations dealing with specific uh, policy teams, they can support that, but we need your voices. And I can only support Stephen's uh, call, use us here in Poland. Uh, uh, we are at your disposal. We'll be happy to convey the message and then act together with knowledge rights and also communia and before i jump to to justus i just wanted to uh, say that stephen might leave us in a second in order to uh, to catch his flight so uh, by all means we don't want you to uh, to um, be late but we're gonna continue nevertheless so uh, moving on to another um i think very relevant uh, advocate for the cause of, of GLAM, um, but I, I won't steal your uh, thunder, I think this is the, uh, the expression, but um, Justus Reiling, uh, Policy Director of Comunia, uh, he's previously worked as Research Fellow at Prior University Berlin, Political Science Department, and as Advisor for uh, International Regulation at Wikimedia Deutschland. He also coordinates the Global Access to Knowledge Coalition. Justus, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, in the absence of any notable Polish skills, I should at least up my metaphor and cultural reference game. I fear my presentation might be a bit boring compared to Stevens now, but <laughs> no worries. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make it through it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and present our 20 policy recommendations for the next decade. Although, rest assured, I will not go through all of the 20 recommendations uh, in an effort not to bore you too much in the afternoon of this conference. So before I start presenting our policy recommendations, let me maybe say a couple of words about Comunia, because it might be obvious to everybody in this room um, who Comunia is. Um, Comunia is an international association uh, incorporated in Belgium and founded in 2011. We advocate for policies that protect and expand the public domain. And we seek to increase access to and reuse of culture and knowledge. Um, yes, so we're basically a, a network of experts and organizations, and our members include Centrum Cifrova, among others, but also Creative Commons, uh, Wikimedia Europe, um, and a few others um, who are also represent in this room. Um, so we developed our 20 policy recommendations um, for the public domain in 2021 and launched them in May of last year, and they supersede our initial policy recommendations. That's maybe a bit boring, so let me just go to the present day. Um, basically, we try to identify possibilities for reshaping copyright um, in ways that expand the public domain, so along our mission, and strengthen uh, the rights of users and all types of cultural creators. We envision a copyright system that maximizes societal benefits um, by embracing the possibilities for wider access to knowledge and culture in an increasingly digitized environment. So as a side note, of course, our policy recommendations are a bit broader than maybe the conference theme, right? And it's not just about libraries and archives, but about um, progressive copyright reform, as we would call it in general. Um, our policy recommendations are the result of two um, considerations. First of all, uh, in 2021, we celebrated our 10th anniversary. So it was time for a bit of a stock taking exercise. What did we achieve after 10 years? But also it was the time after the uh, Digital Single Market Directive had been passed, right? We were following implementation, we were supporting implementation efforts in a couple of countries. Um, needless to say, some aspects of the DSM directive had frustrated us, others we were happier about, 
So, uh, but in general, we thought now is the time to see uh, what we had accomplished with our previous policy recommendations and what we want to accomplish maybe over the next decade. And uh, we see our policy recommendations as some kind of a North Star or guiding light for our policy efforts. So I should say they're rather general, right? They're, they need to be operationalized. They need to be specified in order to be implemented through legislation. And we're currently in the process of developing a number of ideas based on those policy recommendations, which would specifically benefit libraries, archives, and other knowledge institutions uh, with uh, Stephen here right next to me and uh, hopefully help them to fulfill their public missions in the digital environment. So um, the last thing, so we have 20 recommendations, as I said, I won't go through all of them uh, since time is limited. Uh, I will just um, in very uh, broad uh, strokes, um, you know, explain a little bit what we're trying to do. We have four areas for our policy recommendations. The first one uh, are measures to defend and expand uh, the public domain. This is kind of our core mission, so they're very interesting for us, but maybe not so much for you. I will just go through one policy recommendation there. We have measures that protect and promote usage rights, so kind of limitations and exceptions. Um, third, we have measures to empower creators and their audiences. This might also not be super interesting for you, but uh, I will give you an example so that you can see uh, what we're talking about here. And finally, and I think that is maybe um, a bit of a different angle, but quite interesting for you is measures that create safeguards against copyright abuse. Um, because we heard a lot of uh, about uh, legal uncertainty and, and the fear of litigation, etc. And I think those might be quite interesting uh, in this context. So if you want to uh, have a a bit of a better overview of our policy recommendations, I invite you to go to our website, communia-association.org, and yeah, review them for yourselves. So um, yeah, the first um, group of policy recommendations is called Defend and Expand the Public Domain, as I said. Um, here we call, for example, for a shorter copyright term and a requirement of registration both not necessarily immediately realistic, but for us, it's quite important to, to highlight those as, as maybe end goals of our reform project. And um, we think that those are key to basically facilitate the reuse of, reuse of works in a digital environment. What might be interesting for you is maybe our recommendation number three, which says uh, that works and data produced by the public sector should be in the public domain. So this is basically a recommendation to ensure that official texts of a legislative, administrative, or legal nature are part of an essential knowledge commons um, and are too important for the function of our societies to be burdened with copyright restrictions. Thus, we think um, that they should be in the public domain uh, in any case. So in my home country, Germany, for example, of course, legislative texts are not, part, are not protected by copyright. They're out of the scope. But studies commissioned by ministries not so much. So maybe, uh, you know, um, this can be interesting. And, and I think this happens in quite a few uh, European um, member states. Um, yeah, again, I, I think most of those are not directly applicable to your work. So I will just give you this as an example. This one, however, I think is more interesting for you. So under the uh, group of protecting and promoting usage rights, uh, we propose a number of new limitations and exceptions or clarifications maybe to existing uh, uh, limitations and exceptions and i will walk you through a couple of those um so number eight uh basically says we we, we need better uh protection of educational users at the eu level um for example for uh you know activities that take part outside of traditional uh, educational institutions or educational um, settings um we have uh, recommendation number nine, which uh, basically asks the same thing for research users. Um, here we focus on the public dissemination of research activities. I think that goes very well with what Julia has been uh, saying in her presentation. Um, and uh, I think that one might be quite, quite interesting for you to review. Particularly interesting, however, I think is, is recommendation number 10. Uh, here we say that libraries should be able to lend out works in digital formats under the same conditions uh, as works in physical form, controlled digital lending or secure digital lending, as, as Conrad would uh, say, should be fully permitted at the EU level, and uh, libraries should be able to acquire works in digital form in a format 
that would leave libraries in control of the technical environment, enabling digital lending. So, um, yeah, maybe those as an example for the second block of recommendations. There's another one which I'm just mentioning in passing. We also think that users pro protected by fundamental rights should be permitted, even if they're not explicitly allowed by copyright laws. So this is maybe a bit, you know, transgressing the boundaries of traditional copyright law, but we, we, we think that this is maybe something to think about. Um, oh, yes. Uh, and I think this one is actually quite crucial. So I wanted to highlight this one as well. Um, we also say that user rights should be protected against both technological and contractual override. So uh, I think we, we've heard this in a couple of presentations today. Uh, technological protection may, measures maybe not so much since it doesn't really affect uh, secure digital lending, but in other instances of preservation or making available of works, uh, it can be a barrier uh, to the exercise of, of user rights. Um, so um, we would think that circumvention should at least be facilitated under certain conditions. And in any uh, case, we think uh, that abusive contractual practices should be unenforceable. Um, and I think that connects very nicely to what Julia has said in her presentation. Thirdly, we have two recommendations uh, in, in something that is maybe new for us, but we, we want to make sure that copyright actually benefits creators. And uh, I will just mention one uh, of the two recommendations here. We, we, we think that geo-blocking for audiovisual work should be prohibited in Europe. Um, Yes, again, maybe not so relevant for your mission, uh, but but we think that there are some interesting, um, you know, um, models uh, how this could be achieved by maybe introducing some kind of European platform to ensure that audiovisual works are actually accessible from everywhere. Let me come to the last block uh, to conclude my presentation. So create safeguards against copyright use, because I already said that this could be quite interesting to solve, maybe, maybe not solve, but at least um, help with the issue of um, legal risk and facing potentially, you know, very harmful damages. We think that users who act in a reasonable belief that their uses of copyright materials are permitted should not face damages. And I think this particularly uh, applies to institutions where I think often institutions act in a, in a good faith belief. There might be some you know, exceptions, of course, but I think in general, institutions act in a good faith belief that they're users of certain works are permitted and thus should not face the the, the risk of, of potentially uh, fatal um, uh, damages uh, and and i think there's some that that, that could be introduced through uh, legislation to really facilitate the exercise of, of fundamental rights and, and usage rights um yeah maybe uh, to give you another example of what we have here um yes uh, number 19 um, we also think that there should be some uh, access to collective redress mechanisms uh, to protect user rights. So um, basically, um, we, we should put um, users in a position to assert and defend their rights in court uh, through collective means that doesn't exist currently. So it could be an interesting um, avenue um, to, to facilitate the enforcement of, of uh, user rights. This wraps up my presentation. Uh, just a, a last comment, uh, which connects to what Stephen has said. I mean, the, the current election cycle is on, on a downturn. We're expecting elections for next year. This means also new commission, of course. And I think we should really use this opportunity to think about actual legislation. And I think we already do that. <laughs> and uh, yes, I mean, uh, try to operationalize some of the recommendations that have been put forward on this panel and in, in other panels uh, before us uh, to actually change legislation and improve access to culture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Justus. I think uh, Comunia's website is really your uh, go-to place if you uh, if you are looking for knowledge to support your actions, if you decide to then this, uh, there is also a very active blog um, where Bye, Stephen. Thank you. Bye, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone waves. Um, so th this is the place where you really uh, can get support, if I may say. So uh, we are definitely uh, benefiting from that. But this is also a place that uh, really the exchange of knowledge happens. And I think we really, really need that. So same for Knowledge Rights 21. Uh, I I know that I'm, I'm acting here as a, a salesperson now. <laughs> 
uh, but uh, I, I would say in a in a good cause or for a good cause uh, because um, I think this is something I I said when we when it's, we started this day. It's all about being in dialogue, and I think just uh, it's really about being in dialogue with everyone. But the starting point is being with dialogue with the, the right people, uh, just to help you to support your cause, to help you um, kind of understand better the broader context and translate it into your local one. Because uh, to you, I think to us, it's the the more uh, most relevant one. Okay, let's get to uh, Denmark. We promised you to, uh, to take you on a, um, on a journey uh, from a broader European perspective to a national perspective. And that's why we have Michael Christofferson with us. He's a chief consultant at the Digital Public Library of Denmark. He acts as a chief negotiator for the Danish Public Library's e-lending service, e rolen yeah, okay. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> we should have practiced. Uh, he's also a project manager, a manager for digitization in lending and digital competence development at the uh, Copenhagen Libraries. Michael, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, sh I should have told you that I also chair the, uh, the European uh, Public Libraries National Authorities Expert Group on e-lending. Uh, that's not your fault. Um, so first and foremost, uh, thanks for inviting me to Krakow. I was there on holiday in 2016, and the city is even more beautiful than I remember. So thanks for that. Um, I told Stephen this morning over breakfast in the hotel that uh, I always feel a little intimidated when I'm around so many experts on, on copyright. Uh, copyright to the lay person is, is a bit like black magic, I think. Uh, and it just it destroys everything you try to do. <laughs> Um, but, and then he said, but, but on the other hand, you have helped build something that really, really works almost in spite of copyright. So uh, that's interesting, too. So this is why I'm talking to you today. Uh, and uh, the introduction to our national e-learning platform, e it takes about three hours. Uh, so I have boiled it down to one specific point today, uh, which is where publishers and uh, public libraries have an overlap of interest and how we have used this uh, to mutual benefit, I think. Um, first, I need to introduce uh, e-reolen. E <laughs> uh, it means the e-book case, so don't try and pronounce the Danish one, I'll, and, and I won't try and pronounce Polish things. Uh, it's, 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 it's three services, actually. It's a global one which we use, uh, where we use Overdrive for our English language uh, titles. That's not very interesting. This is very interesting. This is for children. Uh, so this is everything we have on our national platform. Uh, but uh, in a front end for children. And we have uh, lent children 1.4 million books last year. So it's a public digital service that makes people uh, makes children read, which is kind of crazy when you say this. I'm going to say it again. It's a public digital service that makes children read. And then there's sort of the classic national e-learning platform. And we use uh, Android, iOS, and web. And, uh, and that's basically it. We have about 92,000 titles now from about 600 plus uh, publishers. So Denmark is a small country. So you, you probably realize by now that most of these are very small publishers. We had 8 million loans in 22, and we're going coming up on 9 million loans in 23 uh, to uh, over 700,000 users. So if this was Poland alone, this would be uh, 58.5 million loans to 4.6 million unique users. So these are respectable numbers. Oh, poor translator, I'm sorry. <laughs> I get enthusiastic, I, I talk too uh, fast, sorry. Um, so uh, a special thing about our service is that we have made our own uh, front ends. We don't, uh, we use Overdrive for the English, but we use our, our front end for the important part, our own front end. And that's because we don't want to, some commercial service to be the library when the library closes. So we remain full control over our front ends. And we excel at children's literature and Danish literature and what you might call quality literature. Uh, it's a bit of a dangerous word. In order to get to my point, I have to get you through very quickly through our history, which is that we, we opened in 2011 with all big publishers on the service. Everything was one copy, multiple uses. So the books were just there. Everybody could check them out. Then in 2012, the big publishers pulled out saying that it was cannibalizing on their sales. They were completely correct. Uh, they had almost no sales from one day to the next. And so we were working on a, they made their own one copy, one user service, which nobody wanted to use. Uh, and so we talked about a compromise and they came back in 2015 with the compromise they were allowed to use one copy, 
one user model for the first uh, six months of a book's lifetime, then they had to go to our one copy multiple user model. So whenever a book stopped being popular, when it, when it uh, disappeared from book uh, sellers' windows, it could, uh, it could come into a, more, a freer model. Um, and they left again. Uh, this time, uh, because our commercial services was popping up everywhere, and they were citing bad prices from us. They, they basically they wanted more money. And we said no. And so we had what I've called the second uh, walk in the desert, where we didn't have our big publishers, all the best books. And in 2018, they came back again, and they have stayed with us uh, ever since. So written as a, uh, as a graph in 2011, which is not here, it's uh, two years to the left. Uh, they were in, then they left in 12, and this is where they came back. Uh, no, this is where they were out. So you can see pretty uh, depressing numbers. And we were threatened, uh, we were existentially threatened. Then they came back. This looks a much better when you only look at it until 2015. Now it just looks like a little uh, bleep. Then they left. Then they came back. Then we had COVID. And we thought that things would uh, cool down after COVID-19. And they didn't. <laughs> Um, so this is this is basically our history. You can see the green line is the number of titles, and the red one are audiobooks. So audiobooks, for all our existence, has been a lot more popular than ebooks. Ebooks are plateauing now, but audiobooks are just taking off. We actually we, can, we don't have to stop it. So in 2016, uh, with the European Court of Justice ruling, uh, we had um, a lot of pressure from our Minister of Culture. She uh, and we were traumatized by these two walks in the desert where we didn't have any books. Uh, we only had the sort of the, the middle publishing houses books. And she did a very Scandinavian thing, which is t bringing everybody into the same room, trying to make a collective agreement. Uh, and I found this picture online and I thought, this, this is funny. This is almost where I was sitting uh, until I realized I had taken that picture. <laughs> and these are library people and minister of culture people and publishers and agents and authors trying to figure out what to do. And she was threatening legislation uh, uh, following the European Court of Justice ruling. And we all knew she was bluffing because she had no idea how she was going to legislate. Um, and she basically said, so you figure it out or I will legislate. So we thought we'll have to figure it out if only to save her from the humiliation of not being able to legislate. Uh, as you may know, I think as Maryland, the state of Maryland and the state of New York uh, in America has tried to legislate on ebooks and, and it has been a disaster. So I took over as the chief negotiator right around here and I had noticed a couple of things. First of all, I had noticed that we were only talking about one to 2% maybe of the books. It was only the most recent, most best-selling books. We agreed that the other 98% of the books should be uh, led by the library. They should be, and people should be able to access them freely and cheaply. I realized that when publishers needed friction, they only have a short window in order to make their money. I don't think there's anything wrong with the commercial service trying to make money. So they have a very short window in order to make their money. And if, if we got these books freely available, we wouldn't be able to afford them anyway. And I'm also not sure that it's a public library's job to give everybody a copy, a digital copy of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, if you, can, if you want to spend money on books, great. If you want to read, great. It doesn't have to be the library who provides you with this book, especially if it's too uh, expensive and we can do other things a lot more clever. You know, the, if you're trying to do a project, they, they say you can, uh, there's price and there's speed and there's quality. So you can pick two, right? If you want something done well and cheaply, it's going, it's going to take a lot of time. If you want something quick and cheap, it's going to be crap, sorry. And it's the same with this price, ease of access, quality of titles. You can pick two, right? You can't have all three, not as long as we, uh, as we have no legislation at least. Um, and I'd also realized that our, our, our literature team, our literature promotion team had built up quite impressive competences when it came to ch children's literature, Danish literature, quality literature. They were really excellent at promoting this to the Danes. Um, and, and finally, and I wish we could spend more time on this, we, we needed some peace so we could do some retro digitization projects. And I, I really wish we had time to talk about this because we made some really cool retro digitization projects with publishers. So the way we, uh, we made this work was, first of all, was the noble art of negotiation is trying to identify what you want and what your opponent wants or your partner wants. What is important to you? What is not so important? How can you exchange it to something that is not so important to them, but who is, which is important to you? So for publishers, friction was important. 
And to us, having the titles, having the rest of the 90 end titles was important. And it's not a zero sum game. What the publishers lose, we don't necessarily gain. And what we lose, publishers don't necessarily gain. All our readers can go do something else, watch TikTok videos, and we all lose. So it's not a zero sum game. Also, Danish is a small market. Denmark is small. I expect Polish to be a small language market as well, even though you are much bigger than us. So most of Danish authors don't want to sell books necessarily. They just want to be read. As you said, they want to, my colleague who changes departments all the time, you said, authors have a message to convey to the readers, and that's all they want to do. And then they can go, go on book talks. It's like musicians, they make no money off of Spotify, but they, they make money off the concert. 1% of Danish authors, maybe 1%, it might be less, are interested in pricing and copyright and, and protecting uh, the most popular titles. Right? So publishers stand between the author and the reader. But libraries do too. Like Stephen said, in a, in a Copernicus uh, model, both publishers and libraries are sort of hovering around the important relationship between the author and the reader. So what are we doing there? Publishers are not necessarily representing authors in their way of doing things. And we need to figure out if we are representing the public when we do things. So what I've come the big win-win through concessions, such as learning to love metered access, is that if you want to be on our national service, you have to give us all your books, not necessarily right away. And if you want to, we will protect them when what with metered access, one copy, one user models, but then we get the, all the rest of your titles and we will promote them. And there is no commercial market for these titles. Five-year-old Danish literature is not a gold mine, right? So we have placed our national service in a very different part of the commercial market than where the commercial market is. The commercial stream is interested in new books, popular books, books like some vampire series where they can always get you the next vampire book. And we want you to read something good, right? So our national service is like a dress shop. We have realized that in order to get people into the shop, we need these fancy titles in the window, but then we make it hard to get to them. But then people are in the shop and then they take up something else. They will loan something else. They will borrow something else. If we don't have them, when we take these principal fights with our publishers and we don't have the fancy dresses in the windows, people don't even come into the shop. Now the two biggest publishers in Denmark realized this and they made two completely different decisions. One of them said, when people use the library, service they can't get to our books because we have friction that's what we wanted and then they will buy the books okay no they won't it turns out they will just check out something else so we don't want to be there we want to retain the value of these popular books and the other one said okay so people come in for the popular titles and they can't get to them then they pick up something else so we should make sure that they got tens of thousands of other books to pick up that we can't sell anywhere else so our, our collaboration, our relationship with publishers is so good now that they're actually writing literary articles on our service, on our platforms. They're promoting their, their literature on the library platform. And does this work? Yes, it does. If you look at this is my colleague from Iblita who made this. I'm sorry about the blue uh, columns. Uh, they haven't been formatted right. But you can see that uh, Denmark has 1.2 in 2021, had 1.2 loans per inhabitant per, um, per cap. Uh, and France, for instance, they have less than a percent of that, uh, Greece even less and so on. But it's not really related to the other, to the next uh, blue column, which is uh, physical lending, because we've done digital lending completely different from each other, whereas our physical libraries tend to look like each other, right? because of hundreds of years of collaboration. But our digital lending services look nothing like each other, which is why we get these very, very uh, confusing stats. And uh, I had one more slide, but, the, <laughs> but that's fine. I just want to say that there is, there are two, the, the title of the slide says, there are two tragedies in life. One is not getting what you want, and the other one is getting it. This has now become so popular that we can't actually afford it anymore. We are not restricted anymore by our publisher's willingness to give us their books. We are restricted by our public library's ability to pay for it. One third of Danish public library users are now strictly digital. One third, but we're not getting any more money, right? We're not getting any more funds. So we have, to, we have to find out a way to finance this new public library where people are completely split up into physical and digital. Only 22% use both physical and digital. 
So it's been a success, but it's also a success that is really challenging the idea of a public library now. And now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Okay. So I would say it's it's over to you now. I know that's so you have, and also to, to our participants uh online who are still with us. Are there questions in the room? Or maybe online. I don't know. No, we don't have okay. Then um I wanted to ask I, I can go first. Then it, it would be I think to all of you to ask about like very practical hints. You're all um, very um, advanced and skilled in doing advocacy and, and policy work and experience in the field. What would be the key components? I'm going to really start with a very broad uh, question. Uh, so what are the, the key elements that really one, a person who wants to start doing the advocacy around his, her area of work? like a, being a practitioner, a, a librarian, archivist, curator, the museum, um, what would be the key elements that you need to take into account when, when dealing with policy and advocacy? The data which is so difficult to find. And I was interested in looking at the graphs and all this empirical uh, evidence that it's brought in favor of uh, a certain action. And I think this is very, very important. So it's not just about uh, theoretical assumptions and uh, what we think is right, even I said so, but data are very important. And I moved to the economic department just for this reason. I just I also want to say that I'm not ejecting uh, the publisher uh, business models. Uh, the contrary, I'm working to see whether there are other business models that can be explored, which means that they do not have to think that that particular traditional model of publication is the only uh, option they have. They have many other options, services, for instance. So there are different routes they can, they, they can pursue. And I think that to reach this point, we need, we need data and we don't have enough. I think you're in an excellent position because you have the testimony that, you know, you know what your experience on a daily basis is relevant and then you only need to translate this into something which is maybe a bit more abstract and makes sense in terms of legislation so i, I think that part is really crucial kind of transforming your daily experience into something that could be then implemented as a law and then maybe a second really important factor i think is framing so coming up with a good wording for what you need, maybe, you know, what is missing or, uh, you know, what the solution would be. Um, I mean, those are just very basic advocacy tools, but but this is how we approach things, right? We, we try to understand what you practitioners lack, what would help you, and then try to draft legislation in a way that it does and come up with the catchy title. <laughs> to actually, you know, get some interest from lawmakers, because if it's not interesting, they will ignore you. Um, well, this shouldn't be a, a library publisher issue, because, I mean, where are the authors in all this? Do, do Polish authors just buy into the notion that their books should not be available through the digital library? I mean, where, what, where, what do they stand to gain? Don't they want readers? That's a question for you. Oh, I think then it's a question to where are you? Ah, okay. So, so the, the author's representative is no longer in the room. But from what I remember from what you were saying, I think it is uh, uh, absolutely about, I'm not an author myself, but it's absolutely about uh, having access to the books. But it's also very relevant about the conditions how this access is being provided. And I think like, um, yeah, this is my understanding of, uh, of uh, our experts' words, was that there is a bit of this um, feeling of not being part of a day conversation, indeed. 
Then coming back to you, how is it in Denmark? Well, it, well, the authors actually uh, have been very good uh, help by the Authors Association in retaining their digital rights rather than just giving it up to their publishers. Uh, and as, as now the, all the commercial services, which were uh, supposed to, uh, the, the, the reason the publisher said in 2015, we are, we are working for you, dear authors, we are protecting your prices. We are protecting your value by not just letting loose through the library service. And we're giving your titles to the commercial services because that's going to be great. And now they are being paid, a, a, a children's book, uh, when a customer reads it, it gets uh, three Polish schlotty there, thereabouts if it's a short children's book. So nobody can live off it anyway. The library actually pays better. Um, so I, I, the Danish uh, uh, Authors Association has been very active in helping their members uh, making better contracts. Uh, for their digital rights, which they have just freely given up. And I think that's a, that's a place to start with the authors, because I mean, without the authors, there would be no books until artificial intelligence starts writing books, right? Absolutely, that's a completely different topic. But there is, I see that there is a question, Kasia, from the room. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if there is any data concerning the decrease of the profits of publishers uh, at times when they cooperated with you and when times that they did not. So what? how does your activity correlate to the profits made by the authors? don't reveal their profit statements. So we don't know. Uh, and they are very provoked every time we talk to authors. Uh, I had a, an author call me and say, well, it's it's no good that people are just are just downloading from your service and I get one uh, one Danish crown every time. And I said, what? I am paying you 12. <laughs> Where did the 11 go? So, uh, and my, my colleague in uh, in Flanders, in, in Belgium, she has the same problem. Authors pulled out of the service uh, because their publishers told them they, were, they weren't making enough money, but they wouldn't divulge this, the, the financial statements. So we had to, uh, had their word for it. But we know that, that the library is now paying really well. So we are, actually have to lower our prices. Uh, after every commercial service went to, uh, to, uh, to measuring the stream, so they, they don't measure a download, they measure how much time do you spend on the platform and then they pay you by the time. And that financial model has, has crashed the payment to authors, but we don't know how much because we can't get to the uh, statements. No, so it was... This was the reason why they returned because... Uh, so you, they could see that the users spent a lot of time on your website. So why, why so many changes? I don't know. Yeah, the reason, the reason they came back again in 2018 is that in 2015, there was one big digital publisher who actually stayed. This was the one who realized, oh, this is going to be a gold mine. And and, and so the other big publishers, after a couple of years, they saw that they were running away with the, with the entire market, so they had to come back. Uh, so that was the reason. So it was the digital publishing house who realized what an opportunity the library was in order to promote all this, all this back catalog. This was the reason why they came back. Uh, in our case, the situation also concerns the existence of the books in illegal places, on illegal websites. In Denmark, it is not the case because you are honest. And this is a strong argument for libraries to act because those books are available anyway. And if they are copied and downloaded uh, illegally, there is no control of publishers and of authors and they do not earn anything from it. Yeah. No piracy, and then I forgot all about it. 
there is no piracy in Denmark because every book is almost every uh, almost every book is available on in Danish. It's available on the library website, and publishers are starting to realize that now. Uh, so the newest books not on the service, well, of course, but I don't think that the piracy market for the, just the new Danish fiction books is is very interesting. If there is a piracy market, it's for academic books and textbooks, which where the libraries are being slaughtered. I mean, we're not getting slaughtered. We're getting bullied a little bit, maybe, but not. I mean, it's no comparison to academic library. Just to very quickly jump on this. I think it it's worth emphasizing the fact that scientific authors do not get any money at all. So, in this case, uh, we are talking about a very specific situation where. We are paid by the public, uh, but then our research does not go to the public. On the contrary, the public has to pay again to read it. So it's really the, so different from the commercial publishing sector that really deserve a different treatment. And all the arguments that we are saying and making about commercial publishing do not really apply to scientific publication. That's really a problem. I just wanted to, sorry, uh, I just wanted to briefly add that I think this is an excellent question because we also have a recommendation in our blog on empowering creators and their audiences that creators should know their audience, should have a right to know their audiences because then obviously the whole kind of mess with people not knowing who extracts how much money from a business, platforms, publishers, etc., cetera, uh, which are, also cuts both ways, I think. I mean, consumers don't know, you know, who's getting paid, how much libraries don't know necessarily, uh, and, and creators um, even less so. So I think uh, th this is quite a crucial uh, recommendation here. I should have maybe included that one instead of the artificial one. So maybe uh, just wanted to remark this. Yeah, thank you. This, uh, thank you for this. I think this has to be our closing remark, but I think it's good to finish on the people and their interests and uh, exactly the connections between them and the understanding and the, the need of this understanding between um, all parties involved, all stakeholders involved and uh, how their interests are being represented or not really represented or taken into account when, um, when the systems are being created. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Um, please join me in in, uh, in applauding our uh, great speakers. <laughs> okay, and now we're going to smoothly jump to the final session. Uh, we thought it would be um, useful. Uh, ah, this this is your final slide. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sorry, the afternoon session. Uh, so uh, we thought it would be good to, um, to finish this very busy and intense day. And thank you for, for staying with us this long. Uh, with, the, with a round of um, immediate feedbacks from our colleagues, uh, also from Knowledge Rights 21. As you know, we, we uh, think Stephen um, introduced the kind of the, the, the operational model of Knowledge Rights 21. And it didn't the program is built uh, also by a network of experts coming from uh, different European states. Uh, we are acting as national coordinators and today, so we uh, in, uh, in Poland, we have a pleasure of being one for, for Poland. Uh, and today we are also joined by uh, Deborah de Angelis, uh, who among other things, is a uh, knowledge rights coordinator uh, in Italy, uh, Anna Lazarova uh, in Bulgaria, and and Jurgis, um, even and I'm probably mispronouncing the name uh, in in Latvia. Uh, before I, I give the floor to you, I will give a bit more kind of insights of who you are, apart from being a knowledge rights when anyone. Um, uh, local co national coordinators, starting with uh, with Anna. Uh, Anna is a practicing lawyer and a lecturer in intellectual property law at Sofia University uh, in Bulgaria. She is involved in digital rights uh, advocacy as part of uh, the Bulgarian Association Digital Republic, and in recent years has been working on copyright policies in connection to EU copyright reform reform and its implementation at the national level. I'm going to make a stop here. Um, 
Deborah is an attorney at law, uh, expert in international copyright law, cultural heritage, entertainment law, and new technologies. She carries out teaching and training activities, organizes numerous conferences and events in the fields of her experience and authored several uh, publications. Um, she is also the lead of the Creative Commons Italian chapter and a representative to the CC Global Network. And last but not least, uh, Jorgis, um, this is your official profile on the, on the Knowledge Race 21. So you studied law at the University of uh, Latvia. His professional career is based on a strong knowledge of legal and copyright issues in libraries. Since 2014, uh, he has been employed at the National Library of Latvia, commencing by working as a project manager in the digital library sector and helping with copyright management of library and digital collections. From 2018, he has worked as a senior legal advisor to the Ministry of Culture, the Copyright Division. Uh, in 2020, he was appointed as a copyright expert under the Department of uh, Library Development. And I'm gonna make a stop here. So I think that because those videos are long and I think, but what I wanted to show by, by uh, reading them out loud, is just to, to show to, to our, uh, um, participants in the room and online, how also diverse the Knowledge Rights 21 um, is in a group of people that um, it gathers. And um, my question to you uh, today is to, uh, to ask about the kind of the flow of the day and what resonated most with you. How do you uh, translate kind of the, because here we mostly had the Polish perspective. This was also the, the aim. We wanted to make sure that uh, we create uh, some space for a discussion, but we have a feeling, and I think also to given our discussions under the Knowledge21 umbrella, that there are things that resonate uh, that, uh, or can be differently addressed, or there is already a solution that has been offered in a different setup in your national setups. So, um, I think I'm going to stop here, and Deborah, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, and uh, thank you, everyone that uh, is still here with us in the, this really interesting and uh, full of uh, uh, discussions about um, how copyright law could be a vehicle for access to knowledge, to culture, and for education and research. And thank you for having me here. Um, I think that uh, we have uh, a really crucial and challenging role uh, to summarize the most uh, relevant part of the conference and the discussion. And what I notice is that uh, the, the issues that we are discussing as a universal nature, uh, since we are facing the same struggle to guarantee access to knowledge for education, research, and culture. Um, for example, the question and challenges that uh, we encounter uh, by today in Poland regarding the implementation of exception and limitation to copyright uh, are the same that I have faced in my country. Uh, this includes difficulties uh, in uh, applying, for example, lending to e-lendings and um, this is also regarding secondary publishing rights, right to retention, and the protection of the public domain. Um, I, uh, we have observed that the implementation, for example, of mandatory exception uh, is not enough, because uh, even though there is a mandatory exception, so it, it, it the European legislator tried to harmonize this field in the, uh, from the above, we have the result that 
in the national legislation, there is a fragmentation. So even in front of mandatory exception and limitation, we still do not have the same access to knowledge in the regional uh, European uh, territory. So maybe what we can do as a national coordinator for um, Knowledge Right 21 uh, regarding, for example, the secondary publishing right, it to, is, could be to draft something that could be uniform to present in front of our national legislator. At least we can achieve and we can have more power for bargaining the uh, implementation that we would like to achieve because we, we, we notice that the tools of the directive is not the right tools to achieve the harmonizations and that we would like to, to have. And also this is a problem that is uh, uh, limiting on the European territories, but as we saw with Maya, uh, there is the need to have uh, the same kind of harmonization also beyond the bordering of the Europe. That's why we were at uh, uh, World, um, or, um, Worldwide Organization uh, for uh, uh, Intellectual Property trying to have uh, a treaty, an international treaty that will allow the exception and limitation for access to culture, education and research all over the world because we cannot be uh, blocked by boundaries. I stop here. <laughs> I, um, I'll try to be short. Um, I'm a practitioner, so I heard some things that's uh, the same in Latvia. We have the same issues. First thing, ebook lending. Our law also uh, allows us to book, lend books, and authors can get money for this. But there is some different story about ebooks. Uh, not because of legislation, but because of publishers. Uh, we have a law uh, of legal uh, deposits that every, every publisher sh should give as a book as a books. So, what about ebooks? Publishers send us link with access to ebook, and we cannot download it. So we cannot storage it, and we cannot give it uh, further to our readers. If we have some ebooks. Uh, 99% is these ebooks we got by license, by contract with uh, publishers. So we uh, bought these books and we have signed papers that we can give it to 10 people or two people in our, uh, only in our library. Next uh, level of access for ebooks is uh, public access in all Latvia. But in this case also, there's uh, some publishers that agreed to sign contract, they gave us uh, access to links that we can give to our clients. And like we uh, clients can read 10 times per month, they can read some ebook. Again, our hands are tight, we cannot do anything. Uh, problem is that we don't get this physical data of ebooks that we can lend out for our readers. Uh, why it is so, I don't know, because authors' organiza organization doesn't mind that we give uh, books. Authors are happy that we give, and they get money as for all the books. But publishers are problem in Latvia, and maybe they should talk with Denmark. As we heard, Denmark has great experience with e-book lending. Uh, one important thing is not only that these books cannot be accessible uh, by people, but we cannot preserve them to uh, next generations. These books are lost actually, because uh, it happens frequently that publisher bankrupt, uh, gets bankrupted or just liquidated, uh, destroyed or something like that. And these books just dis disappear because they're not in our archives. Many uh, big publishers are coming to us frequently asking for some books that they want to create again, because they don't have these books. And with eBooks, it's, it's over. And one more thing, uh, new reality has shown us that we should make copies of, of everything and store them somewhere else. Uh, we had re recently a visit from Ukrainian colleagues and their experience is that in some parts of Ukraine, all cities are raised, libraries are raised, museums are raised, and there's nothing left, totally nothing. Everything what, what was in this building is destroyed. So 
it's very important to make digital copies of everything and make copies for our future generations. Is that about ebooks? Uh, one more thing. Can I? Yeah. Uh, I heard one uh, good thing uh, from practitioners. Uh, book covers. There was some emotions in the <laughs> in auditorium. Uh, this is a question I get frequently for uh, our librarians. What we can do with book covers? As lawyer, I should say we cannot uh, publish them. They are copyright protected works, especially if there's some uh, nice painting on this uh, book cover. Uh, our copyright organizations think that we should pay even for uh, library catalogs where, where we have these small uh, uh, pictures of books. And as I know, our uh, museums of culture and archives already are paying for their catalogs where they have small uh, pictures of paintings. And after uh, half a month, I, had, I will have a meeting with copyright organization and it looks like we will have to pay too. But, uh, Usually, librarians ask us about not catalogs, but about their Facebook pages, about web pages, where they want to uh, advertise those new works. Uh, this is a little bit different. Uh, publishers usually usually know about this, but they don't mind that we are doing so. So I, I'll just, I'm just saying, uh, put in these pictures of new books, but don't make one-to-one -one copy. Uh, put this book on the table with other few books, make a picture and say, we have new books about this and this and this. So you don't have to make a direct copy of, bo of this book cover. You make it uh, as some uh, few objects of new things that you have. So shortly, that's most important what I caught. Uh, hello. Um... First of all, congratulations to uh, to Centrum Cifrove, to the Jagiellonian University, and the team of organizers for uh, organizing this wonderful event. Um, it's really a challenging task to summarize uh, <laughs> everything that I am taking from uh, this conference home, uh, especially given that everyone is very tired already. Uh, but I uh, took a lot of notes and I'll be using them because Bulgaria, like Poland, is one of the very few countries left uh, that uh, have to yet that are yet to implement the CDSM directive. <laughs> so uh, it also gives us, I think, a great opportunity to uh, implement some of the mechanisms that we have been discussing today. Right? Um, now, there were a lot of very important topics uh, uh, that were discussed today. Uh, I am very passionate, for instance, about exceptions, uh, can talk a lot about the way they were not exactly harmonized, and uh, the current state of, as uh, Professor Zganga put it, extreme uh, fragmentation of copyright exceptions and limitations in the European Union. Uh, the fact that uh, this was not remedied by the CDSM directive, um, even in some cases, these problems were exacerbated, like for instance, with the teaching, digital teaching exception. Uh, now in uh, a lot of countries, we have a, like a double regime with two exceptions that uh, uh, overlap in some way. Uh, also, uh, in our legislative proposal for the implementation of the directive, we also have problems with the out-of-commerce works mechanism. It's not detailed at all. Uh, the legislator counts on uh, libraries to clear all these issues with CMEOs, which is very problematic, I'd say. They're... <laughs> yes. Um, what else? Uh, we also have in Bulgarian discrepancies between the copyright regime and the regime uh, on protection of uh, cultural heritage, which, which is something that we need to address as well. Uh, I will just focus on e-lending in order to be brief. <laughs> so in Bulgaria, we have a technology neutral provision. So um, technically, libraries are allowed to e-lend. Uh, however, uh, the law, the, the legal provision is, is structured like 
like in the rental and lending directive, where we have this general um, public lending right to remuneration. But then we also have an exemption uh, for some of the actors uh, who are able to lend with no remuneration. The problem is that most of the libraries are exempted from remuneration. I mean, it's not a problem for libraries, of course, uh, but uh, giving the interpretation of the Court of Justice in the VOB case, uh, the court says that uh, uh, it is necessary to remunerate authors in order not to um, not to prejudice uh, uh, unreasonably their legitimate interests, which means that in our current case in Bulgaria, e-lending would probably not um, not meet the criteria of the three-step test. And in any case, no e-lending is going on at all. Even though uh, libraries may have this legal opportunity in practice, first of all, publishers are refusing to sell ebooks to, to libraries. And second of all, I, I think that libraries are not fully aware of the scope of their faculties under the law. Uh, concerning the um, digitization of uh, copies for the purpose of e-lending, uh, I also agree with, uh, with the conclusions of your report that uh, we can use the joint inter interpretation of the Ulmer decision and the VOB decision in order to uh, be able to digitize copies and then lend them. Uh, and it's a viable option. Uh, just to be conscious of something that the VOB decision says, uh, in, uh, in paragraph 64, the decision says that member states may require that a digital copy of a book subject to such lending must have first been put into circulation by the rights holder or with his consent, which can limit a bit this mechanism. So it's also our uh, job, in my opinion, to uh, prevent such uh, uh, additional requirements to appear in the, in the national law. Uh, and uh, finally, notwithstanding the legal regime, there are, of course, practical issues uh, concerning e lending uh, by libraries. Uh, first, it was mentioned that libraries have no sufficient resources to secure e lending. Uh, as far as I'm aware, in Bulgaria, some publishers don't secure their uh, copy, the copies that they sell to the ebooks that they sell to the general public at all. So it, it should really fall on the library to, to take care of this, which is an enormous uh, obligation. Then uh, concerning risk management, because we were talking about the appetite for, uh, <laughs> for risk, um, we are all aware that uh, librarian professionals are not uh, really keen on engaging in risky behavior. Uh, let's say it's not exactly i wouldn't say risky behavior more more exploring the full scope of the opportunities that the law provides them right uh, because of uh, of the cost of uh, litigation but also libraries are not keen on taking legal measures against for example publishers when when publishers refuse to sell them ebooks um and, and this is quite uh, understandable. You know, we all know that uh, libraries in, in most of the countries, maybe not in Denmark, but in most countries, libraries are chronically underfunded, right? And this is the situation in Bulgaria is certainly a similar one. Uh, and here is the role of non-governmental organization of the non-governmental sector, in my opinion, and of programs like Knowledge Rights 21 to support library professionals in these endeavors. Uh, there are a lot of organizations currently that uh, provide, uh, including financial support for strategic litigation. And this is something that uh, should be explored, in my opinion. And not only strategic litigation, but also trainings in order for uh, librarians to. to uh, make use of all the resources that the law has already given them. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, the main challenge, as it was discussed in the last panel, uh, in my opinion, is that on national level in most countries, uh, but as uh, Stephen said, uh, this is the situation also on EU level. Uh, traditionally, uh, copyright policies are focused on the interest of copyright holders and public interest users are not or are rarely uh, recognized as stakeholders in this process. And this is something that we, uh, we need to change. Uh, I'll be uh, ending here <laughs> not to, uh, in order not to bore you. Thank you very much once more for uh, the invitation. And um, I, I guess we could continue the discussion after the, the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Deborah and Jorges. Uh, thank you for uh, basically uh, doing my job <laughs> and summarizing the whole day. I think the, the only um, aspect I can add, add is that, Mikael, we are go all going to Denmark, we are all moving to Denmark, but actually we can't. So this means that we need to keep on working. And this is, again, an invitation from our side. And uh, to Knowledge to, uh, Rights 21, to, to join all of us, uh, to Comunia, to all the networks, but also to just start or continue, actually, because I think many of you and also um, those joining online, you are already part of uh, discussions. But I think uh, my biggest takeaway from today is that uh, we need to be louder. And I think I'm going to I'm going to stop it he uh, here. Um, I'm so happy with the time we made this. So without a delay, in five minutes, I'm going to stand up just to briefly say thank you to everyone. First of all, to you staying with us uh, the whole day and to those of you uh, still uh, with us online. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you, your presence and being part of this discussion. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge, uh, your expertise with us. Thank you to the uh, interpreters. I think a big la uh, round of applause. You know, copyright translated, it's not that easy. Uh, thank you to our technical team support. Uh, we couldn't have done uh, without you. And um, I think last but not least, but I, okay. I see Conrad, but I don't see. Yeah, uh, to my team, to to my team at Centrum Cifrowe and to the, the our uh, friends and colleagues at the uh, Jagiellonian University for uh, for making this turning this idea uh, into reality. We uh, we really enjoyed it, enjoyed it a lot, and uh, to us this is step one of many. So thank you. And I don't know why I was speaking English. <laughs> Thank you very much.